I'm Ted Lohman. And I'm Peggy Kane, and this is Off the Record. Peggy, why don't you get right into the guests? It's going to be a good show tonight. Oh, it is going to be a good show. We've had an opportunity to talk to our guests for a few moments, and he's come loaded with all kinds of information on the UFO phenomenon, uh, lots of photographs, so I think it's going to be a really interesting show. Would you like to introduce the guests? Today's guest came to me from a, a person that has been on the show for a number of times throughout the years and has become a real close friend both to uh, Peggy and I in the UFOAZ group as well as the Off the Record group, Helga Morrow and Gary Morrow. Um, gave me a phone call. We were going to have uh, quite uh, an interesting show having to do with chemitology, having to do with Egypt. Um, but Helga gave me a phone call and said, would you like to have a live guest? And I said, why, certainly. So right now I'd like to introduce Augie Nost. Did I say that correctly? Yes, you did. And he is a transplant. He's from uh, Norway, Norwegian, like myself. Uh, he's been in the country about 27 years. He just moved to Tucson, Arizona. We're very fortunate to have him here as a guest. Uh, he's written a book. He's got a lot of information. So. Um, why don't we just uh, start off, how did you get involved in this, Augie? Uh, did you uh, grow up with this type of thing in Norway, or did you find it somewhere else? Well, I think I've been interested in uh, the paranormal, which of course includes the UFOs very much, since I was probably about three inches tall. And um, as a little kid, I started out reading stuff about this, and I built myself a UFO detector probably by the time I was about 10 or 11, 8, 9, 10, something like that. And uh, it was a basic, uh, simple principle, and the thing worked. It rang several times, and uh, twice of the times that the bell went off, I grabbed the binoculars and went outside, and I did see two crafts, two different times. Was this in Norway? Yeah, that was in Norway. And I think the first time I saw that, I was excited. I didn't know what to do with myself. And that was a triangular craft that uh, was just hanging, hanging in the sky, right across the uh, inlet of the uh, ocean on the other side. And uh, I ran inside uh, and was going to, you know, tell somebody about it, came back, and then it was gone. But uh, that was the very start. What, what's this device? What's this thing that rings the bell? Was it somebody on your roof pulling a string saying, hey, look at uh, Well, that probably would have worked too, but I, I used a compass. I, in fact, I have a drawing in the book. I can, uh, sure. I can uh, dig it right out here, and I can hold it up so we can see it. It's very simple. You can probably go to the hardware store and get the components for it for 15 bucks and put it together in about maybe 45 <coughs> minutes. Just so hold it there. Let them get that. They will. Yeah, here it is. Uh, it's very simple. You got a compass. You got a battery. You got a breaker switch. And uh, you just, uh, you know, a bell there, and you just uh, wire it up in a circuit so that you put the wires on each side of the compass needle. When the compass needle turns, it touches the wire and the bell goes off and just close the circuit. Because when a flying saucer that is built on electrostatic or anti-gravity propulsion, when it moves through the atmosphere or through a fluid, it creates ripples in the Earth's magnetic field. And that will turn or wiggle a compass needle. And on that principle, this thing works. So that would just go off. It, was there, uh, when you were still in Norway, was there much interest uh, or investigation of you, uh, the UFO phenomena? Yeah. Uh, of course, in my local community, there was probably more interest in me because they thought I was so weird that they had to keep an eye on me. But uh, I think... Uh, I opened up the eyes of quite a few people uh, over the few years that I uh, talked about it because I got some evidence actually that I thought was evidence and I got some books and uh, my friends read them, uh, some of them, and uh, it got uh, quite interested and uh, I have uh, had several personal encounters that way. Hmm. Would you like to talk about those personal encounters? Uh, yeah. Uh, the um, the uh, other time that I know the bell went off and I saw them was a light a bright light in the middle of the day that was very bright. And it was moving across the sky, and that one uh, I would consider also being, I consider it to be a UFO, because it did set the bell off. If it didn't, then it could be something else. Of course, now, this type of UFO detector, I do not b believe can detect all flying saucers or alien spacecraft, because if it is 
propelled by, uh, let's say, crystal technology or conscious technology, it won't do anything for it. Or there may be other propulsion systems that is not in any way magnetic, and that will not do anything for it. Well, I think one of the problems, speaking of alien aircraft, one of the problems with, with, you know, right now is that deci deciding what is alien, what is government, yeah. I'm talking about the United States government, and even uh, back, you know, during the time of the German uh, saucer yes. technology, they, they, they had some pretty advanced craft flying around there, too. So how, how does one even begin to know what they're looking at? I think that's, you just touched on it, I think that's probably where a lot of it started, because Hitler gave his scientists total free reign, create whatever you want. It is not like here. The scientists in this country that told very strictly, don't you mess with the oil industry. Like a quick little example, totally on the side of what we're talking about here. I have, for, I have a patent copy of a carburetor that get 204 miles per gallon created in 1939 by Charles Poe in Canada. Well, yeah, good but point. guess what gas mileage we have now. And the same thing with other things, and uh, like Hitler, he created a synthetic <coughs> fuel, and he also created uh, an anti-gravity system. The Hanabu-1, that had a fuel, regular gasoline engine in it. It was very unstable, and it crashed, so they scrapped that one. But the Hanabu-2 and the 3, they created 263 known crafts that there were records of when they uh, took Germany over and the Allies. Where did you get this information? How can I look this up? I have uh, some uh, movie footage and some information, sorry to say, in storage in Omaha, but I, I will get it down here when I move. No, but, I mean, where did this information, 203, the Germans had 203 actual working craft at that time? They had built that many. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, so they had, yeah. did they have a fleet of them? They had a whole fleet of them. And then when the, when the United States and Russia came over, they... Some of them were uh, taken by the Allied forces and uh, both the Americans and the Russians. There were some crafts that were uh, not flyable. They were in maintenance probably. They were, some of them disappeared into Russia. Some of them probably disappeared over here. And that technology was perfected now for over 50 years. Now, where did that technology come from in your research? Where did you find out, Augie, where that came from? Was it extraterrestrial or was it here terrestrial engineering that uh, developed the Hanabu? The Hanabu, since it came from a gasoline engine, I believe Hitler's own scientists developed. When it came to the anti-gravity system, I'm not so sure. If they found the crashed saucer that they may have back engineered, I am not sure. That is, that is, I don't have any information on that. There's been some talk about uh, this, these, a certain se uh, segment of the German population going down into the Antarctica and setting mm -hmm. up a base there. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, they, uh, after the end of the war, most of those crafts, they were flown out. And the German officers and uh, their families, they got on the ship and they flew to South America. They set up a base in South America. And uh, this, th these are facts. <coughs> and uh, they were there for a, a couple of few years, just a very few years, three or four years maybe. And then they left from there and they went down to the South Pole area, which they created, set up a little area for themselves, which they call Neue Schwabenland. And uh, they're still there. It is now a lot bigger area. It is totally German. They speak German. And these this German colony down there is very well known to the federal government or factions of it. They do business with them. And, uh, of course, this is covered up very deep within the... Well, there's an interesting little sideline to all this because you, when you look at the photographs of the Adamski craft, mm -hmm. the, the sh ship that, that the man on the ship claimed he was from Venus, and, but the, these photographs all look like these bell-shaped German saucers. Yes. So what do you think there's a connection there between what was happening with the Damsky yeah. and the uh, contact? The Damsky saucer, as we see in pictures of it, that is uh, almost a total duplicate of what the Hanover II was. So do you think that 
he was just making this up, or do you think possibly No, I think they lied to him. So you think that these Germans who were now flying these saucers came and claimed to be from Venus? Yeah, I think what, what so. Would, what was the, what's the purpose, just to, why would they do that? Well, I think it would probably be to their advantage not to let the world know where they were at, who they were, especially since they were Germans. They were not very popular at that time. Well, I don't know. If somebody had that kind of technology, the United States uh, brought a lot through Operation Paperclip, brought a lot of highly qualified individuals uh, into this country knowing full well that they were German. Uh, even our CIA uh, in the beginning was, was structured under a German uh, uh, Gestapo type of uh, tactics. Um, Oh, they created the, the some of these things that that you're talking about having to do with New Schwabenland and the the uh, Germans coming into South America. Um, can you lead some of our viewers to anything, if uh, any type of writings or videos or films or research uh, that uh, brought you to these conclusions? I have a video. And on that video, you see movie footage of the uh, craft flying around. In fact, they get so close, you can just about reach out and touch them. And they also show schematics of the engines. Uh, it's written in German. And uh, there are drawings of uh, the engines. There are uh, some pictures of uh, engine compartments. Do you know who put out this video? Offhand? Uh, it says on the casing, and I cannot... Was it Germans, or was it... No, the, it's research that is done after the war. But uh, the movie footage was some that was created by Hitler. That is, all the drawings was created. They came from the archives of Hitler. Hmm. That would be very interesting to see, don't mm -hmm. you think? That would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you've got a number of different things. Right off the bat here, I want to be able to uh, allow the people to uh, get a uh, phone number and an address that if they do need to get in touch with you in any way. You do have, uh, you are an author, you do have a book, you also have some uh, individual pictures and things that um, uh, we will be showing during the course of the show having to do with the moon. <coughs> some of the research that you've um, uh, been very active in talking with uh, NASA and bringing some of these photos up. Uh, how can they get in touch with you, Augie? Uh, we can... Um First of all, if they are interested in getting a hold of the book, I have a phone number where they can call to get the book, and that's 760-327-7348. So if you're interested in, 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 in the name of the book is what? The yes, Alien Encounters in America's Midwest. Okay. But it's not just the Midwest. There are African documents and federal government <coughs> documents Excuse and stuff. Me. Why don't you give the number again real slow? That is 760 uh, Three two seven seven three four eight. Okay. Uh, I wanted to just, uh, I guess, a few weeks ago, there was a program that aired, and it was so the, the world's greatest hoaxes. And, and one of those uh, segments was the Billy Myers uh, case, his uh, contact with uh, extraterrestrials who claimed they were from the Pleiades. Mm -hmm. The the I thought it was a very poorly done. Uh, film, it didn't really discredit, I mean, it, it, it just wasn't well done. Uh, but there is a certain theory that perhaps maybe the, some of these Pleiadians may have also had connections with the German because of their speaking German, and uh, I think that there, there's some um, a theory also that they had gotten to a point where they were able to then you know, fly these saucers around and uh, make contact with with mm -hmm. Billy Meyer for whatever reason, and that they weren't actually from the Pleiades at all. That they they may have been from this uh, New Schwabenland. Have you heard anything about that? I've heard the theory. I I do believe that that was a Pleiadian connection. Okay. I think that he, uh, in some circles, he's been given a bad rap. Oh, I'll definitely go along with that. Um, if, you've, if you're in the UFO field and you don't have tomato stains on your shirt, then you haven't, <laughs> you haven't made it within the field. 
Uh, I think that you, the closer you come to the uh, notoriety and getting your name out there, the more people yeah. that want to tear you down and discredit you. So um, it's it's been a very interesting field over the last 10 years that I've been involved in it. Uh, needless to say, having to do with uh, the content of the whole UFO phenomena. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about uh, uh, some of the stuff that you were doing with the moon. Did you, have you been involved in any of Fred or Glenn Steckling's work having no. to do with the moon? I, uh, I do have his book. I, uh, I read some of his material. That's really all I... Isn't this one yeah. photograph that you have here mm -hmm. on the cover of his book? Uh, this, not... The one that has that, yeah. uh, like that, that... Yeah, this one here is on the cover of his book. Yes, yes. Why don't we, uh, yeah. don't we have a, uh, a good copy of that too? Yeah, this is the, the, this the original NASA print is uh, in the stack. Did it, did it get put under here? Yeah, that's where it's at. Yeah. Why don't you hold that up in the other that's one? Uh, they, okay. I think they did a trick on this one because when they sent the original NASA print, they turned it 90 degrees so they cut off the tip of the craft, thereby you cannot see it, that it's floating in, in thin air. Let me hold it up here. Yeah. Let's see and the other one that show that it's a tip to it so it's not attached to anything. This is the original NASA print and then this, which just uh, shows like, whoops, am I Let me just, uh, yeah, you, uh, yeah, we got it now. Uh, there, the end of it, of the, the um, it's been cut off on this side. But in this, let me just show this which is a, a photocopy, which is not as clear, but it's, um, you can see the end, the tip on the side uh, is, is pretty visible. So that you're saying that this may have been a craft. If I do it anymore, Glenn, I'm going to be down here. <laughs> That's as good as it's going to get. Um, yeah, in Steckling's book, I think, no. uh, in, in it's this way. It actually, he has his book this way on, on the, the craft. And this is how uh, it's this is how it's set. I don't remember, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's a very Just, interesting. I think for the audience too. Why don't we uh, give them the plate number and everything so they sure. can write yeah. to NASA Absolutely. and uh, don't take our word for it. Just write to them and uh, they can get this. This is a phenomenal picture. This plate number ninety nine, NASA Apollo sixteen. It's the um, picture number sixteen dash one nine. Two, three, eight. Say that last part again. Uh, picture number nine, uh, 16, one, nine, two, three, eight. Okay. Mm. And there's some other pictures too. Yeah, why don't we show some more of these for? Uh, there is another one that really puzzles me a little bit, and that is one here. There's a shorter, there is a shorter um, cigar-shaped craft. But there's smoke coming off the smoke drifting away from it. As if there was vapor around it? Right. But you see, NASA that creates call, a problem. Well, NASA would say that that was some Sorry. kind of a uh, urine dump or something like they did on <laughs> STS-48. Yeah. Right. But any, anybody that thinks about that is that if you dump a liquid into a total vacuum, it goes in 360 degree directions. It doesn't drift in one direction. Do you want to give the uh, number of that? 11? Yeah. Why don't you give that? Something? And it's uh, plate number 111, Apollo 11, and the picture number 11 37 5438. The thing about it is that if there were no atmosphere on the moon, this vapor could not happen. The first of all, there has to be. Because everybody has seen Armstrong step his foot yes. onto it, and you can't cause a footprint without uh, an atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Now, whether or not, I'm not sold whether or not Armstrong actually stepped on the moon at the time that he said he stepped on the moon. I do believe we went to the moon, mm -hmm. but I'm not sold on whether or not at that particular time we made it or if we uh, just developed and came back to it. The Russians have never, you know, the United States are the only people that have ever stepped on the moon. As we know of, that's true. And if you have to believe in UFOs or aliens, 
which I happen to believe that there are such things, then it would be ludicrous not to believe that there wouldn't be a base on the moon. I mean, it's just, it's stupid not to believe something like that. I mean, if they're coming all the way from here and setting up a post to study the planet Earth, what better place to do it than on the moon? Especially the, the, the close vicinity of the moon that, that we have. You know, we have a dark side that really isn't dark, but it's dark to us consistently, mm -hmm. which is a great place to hide. Mm -hmm. And um, I think Hoagland had uh, something going on in, in, in what he had to say about uh, structures on the moon. Now, you also have a picture. Now, you're not saying, you, you're not actually saying that Hoagland and you uh, are working on the same thing. What you're saying is that you have a picture that looks like there could possibly is a structure on there also, right? Yes. Where is that picture? Uh, it's this one here. It had a tower or something. It I is a very, us. very tall tower. It yeah, looks why don't like you show that picture? It is said okay. to be about two miles tall. Can you get this? And it's right in the center? Can you yeah. even see it? I think it's right, um, I think that that's there. You can get that little structure sticking up. <coughs> now just recently NASA has also come over with, along with some of the scientists saying that they've actually found ice on the, on the moon. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't that have to say that at, that the, at least at the pole areas yeah. that there is some atmosphere there? Yeah, and this picture kind of proves that actually because here it this is a colored NASA print showing green vegetation. Now, also, um, there is also some orange ve vegetation or orange-looking substance on the surface of, of the moon that, uh, mm -hmm. that NASA has also to go along with the green. Yeah. You know who was doing some of this work, too? Was years ago, Vladimir Trzinski was involved yeah, in doing a lot of information, and he was jokingly saying, now, mark my words, years from now they'll be saying that there's water on the back side of the moon and they could go water skiing. Well, actually, you probably couldn't go water skiing, but you might be able to go ice skating now. Yeah, really. And everybody laughed at uh, yeah. Vlad. So, And Vlad was very heavily into uh, German saucers, too, mm -hmm. and the propulsionary system. So Vlad might be going full circle here for us. Well, there's a book that you brought that... Um uh, uh, it's, it's called Secrets of Our Spaceship Moon, and it has a lot of... It's a very old book. It's yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Don, yeah, Don uh, Wilson. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, he talks a lot about all the anomalous uh, elements about the moon that would lead you to believe that it was actually maybe at created. one uh, point created as a, a craft. And while that sounds crazy, I mean, just the very fact that the moon... When, it, it, when we have a full lunar eclipse, uh, the or the solar eclipse, the moon is perfect. I mean, the way it just blocks out the sun absolutely perfectly. Yeah. It, you know, what is what is what is the chances that what are the chances of that being a random event? I mean, just, you know, a satellite being that perfect. Well, there's a lot of things that go along with the moon too. It's almost as if somebody has created this whole hologram for us to live in. You know, you have the 28-day moon cycles for women. You have a lot of the, the Mayan calendar was all brought up under the 28-day moon. Um, that's why a lot of people are called lunatics. Uh, early on, during the period of time when the full moon would come out, people would do weird things. It has uh, a, a magnetic force that pulls on our tides, moves in and out on a ba basics uh, of water. There's a lot of interesting things that have to do with the moon. Um, that coincide with this planet Earth. It is one of the largest of some of the moons in this, this it's bigger than the moons around Mars until you get out to the great planets. Um, it's just a very, very interesting place. And I'm surprised, and I'm sure you are too, Augie, that we've never gone back. Uh, since yeah, isn't the that, doesn't that seem strange that, you know, we've just, we went there and then that was it. And well, we never I, I guess the word on the street in NASA is that we were told not to go back from the ones right. that are there. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about just, water on the moon. Yeah. Okay. I think there's water on the moon because it probably is in those two water tanks right there. Okay, I'll point. There's a very clear, that clear as a bell. They're round, they're straight up. All right. Um, well, this would be interesting really to get the plate number on this one too. Yeah. yeah. So that individuals can do their own investigation. It's plate number 149, uh, Apollo 16. And the picture number 
9918. And they'll send it to you. Mm -hmm. You may have to s ask them two or three times because they really don't like to part with this information. Is there, is there a ch cost behind it? I think there's a couple bucks for the printing. Of yes, it, it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and Very also, little. when you do send anything to uh, NASA or now you can send it to uh, Houston or JPL or where do you send? Where do you go to find out about this? I um, <coughs> actually, what you can do is I think you can go to here at the lunar. Uh, we have in Tucson. If you're viewing this here in Tucson, we have one of the largest uh, uh, depositories for um, pictures on the on the moon itself. So I think that you could find um, information pertaining to where you can get these uh, pictures. Where would that be? Like at Flandro? No, it's well. It's yeah, probably a Flandro, but there is a place here at the university that is dedicated to the moon, and they have literally millions of pictures. I got the name and address and phone number of the lady that you need to write to right here because oh, cool. she's the one that uh, gave it to me, and it's the Center for Advanced Space Studies, Lunar and Planetary Institute, and the lady's name to address it to is Mary Noel Black very accommodating person and when I got these pictures from her the last time she was so interested in them she took them home and she studied them herself Really? she hung on to them for a week before she sent it to me and she told me that she just had to have a copy of them herself he's going to do a little close-up on that address okay. so just so hold just on hold to it yeah, it's uh, 300 Bay Area Boulevard Houston Texas 77058 Telephone 713-486-2182. Yeah, I've heard they're very accommodating, but what you need to do is you need to know your plate numbers, what Apollo mission. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you need to know the facts because literally when you say, I want this picture of this thing, they have millions of them yeah. of pictures that are being taken. Another trick to that one too is that ask her <coughs> to blow it up. She'll do that. This is a blow-up that I asked for, and that's why we can see the, uh, the uh, water tanks. Otherwise, it's very hard to see. Mm -hmm. You may have to blow it up yourself. There's been a lot of interesting anomalies now. Um, I know when I was interested in it, I've read uh, Wilson's book, and there's another book out. Um, what, did, what is the name of this book? There this Wilson. one's called The Secrets of Our Spaceship yeah, the, Moon. Yeah, Spaceship Moon. Um, there's a couple other books out having to do with the moon. Yeah. Uh, they're very, very interesting. They're also very hard to find any longer. Yeah. Uh, Fred Steckling um, has had uh, a book out on the moon for a number of years. He's an extensive investigator and researcher having to do with that. Uh, he has passed on now. Um, mm -hmm. He was with an, and involved with um, George Adamski. And there information dovetails right into some of your information here and there are some incredible photos yeah you know that one of the uh, hypotheses has been that the moon is hollow and uh, <coughs> but there's also been some uh, theories that the earth is hollow the hollow earth theory and uh, I think you um, want to you yeah, have some I have information a NASA about that copy of a NASA print that actually shows the entrance uh, I think, though, that uh, this is uh, this is um, a uh, NASA print taken by the SS-7 satellite in 1968, oh, sitting in a 32,000-mile circular polar orbit, taking the picture straight down towards Earth, and you will see a huge hole at the North Pole. How come it's not readily visible, though, to aircraft? Uh, how do we know that? We really well, don't know. Let me explain you how we don't see it. When you're talking about a, a hole that big, when you fly up there, if you have a distance, I mean, this hole is supposed to be six to seven hundred miles wide. Let me see. Sixty-seven. Six to seven hundred miles wide. You, when you fly, let's say from uh, you know, fly over the pole to Tokyo. When you fly up towards the pole, you don't fly over the empty space in the middle. You fly inside the rim of the hole. And because of the size of the whole thing, it looks like you're looking out towards the horizon. I have talked to a pilot that flies. I made great effort in talking to this guy. He flies the uh, Concorde. 
and he said, when you fly over the pole, it is really funny, because when you look at the horizon on the left side, the horizon goes, dips down in the middle, and when you look at the horizon on the right side of the aircraft going from the U.S. To over the pole, it goes the other way. He had no explanation for it. And at the time, I didn't uh, think too much of it either until I talked to him, but uh, that kind of puzzles me. If there wasn't that there was a hole right there, why would the dip be down? So if they're, but if, if they're flying over the, and they're looking straight down, wouldn't they see no. into because the Because you don't get in the middle because there's nothing there. Did oh. you say that, the, how big is this hole? Six, some, probably about 600 miles wide. Once in a while, you can see the um, weather computer screwing up and leaving the hole barren when you take a picture towards the pole. Why would they not want people to know that? I think it all goes back to that the whole economy of Earth is oil-based. If it became common knowledge that there are a civilization in there that has crafts and the t kind of technology that we don't need fuel for, I mean, gas anymore, gasoline or oil, and of course they have abolished sickness, that would be a horrible thing. And now how do you know this? You're making these statements, but how do you know these, Augie? Well, we know that the, this planet is an oil-based economy. Right, okay. I'll follow that. And we also know that uh, if they're flying these crafts, then they're not using gasoline to power them. I could probably buy and, that. And uh, the oil companies will do anything, including, well, the worst we can think of, to make sure that this information would not get into the hands of the people that is capable of creating a different propulsion system that will replace theirs. You also... Uh jump in here, but you also mentioned that it's some, there was some study, and I don't remember where, saying that the Earth actually is lighter than it should be if it was a solid mm -hmm. ball. Or if you take the size of the sun, because of the size of the sun, we can figure the strength of the gravity. Then you take the size of Earth and the distance from the sun and the <coughs> speed at which Earth is traveling around the sun if you feed all those numbers into the computer with the earth being solid as a solid mass the numbers don't come out because there's too much mass at this compared to the speed we are going around the sun the earth will be the leaving the solar system if it was much lighter than what it sh what it appears to be then we would be able to stay in the orbit we are in and how deep do they think the crust is then? Because we hear about all these underground caverns yeah. and you know uh, bases and things. Probably about somewhere around three, three to five thousand miles. Mm. Well, I don't know. I've got. I know this is a tough. This, trip. Yeah, this is a hell of a jump for me because my. The hole in the poles you know, again. I, oh, but my <laughs> bullshit meter is going off, and, and uh, you know I had where we've come from. Uh, extraterrestrials to things living on the moon to New Schwabenland. Mm -hmm. Now, I think I can swallow most of that. But, I don't know, right now we're having weather anomalies. You know, Richard Hoagland's coming out with a lot of things that circle are having to do with photographs shot with uh, um, satellites and and I've, I've I've seen this photograph time and time again and I've always made fun of the hole in the pole um, I, know. I don't know you know I, I've interviewed a guy uh, five six seven years ago says that he was Admiral Byrd's nephew and he went he knows all these holes in the poles and underground caves you know where he goes into it I'm going to leave that up to the scientists. I'm just going to, one photograph does not mean that there is, and that's pretty, whoever cored that hole made an awful round. Almost looks like an iris, doesn't it? An eyeball looking at you. Mm -hmm. The eye in the sky looking back at you. I don't know. Um, I've heard the same theories, Augie, about the moon. Yeah. I've heard bird flying through it. Actually, if you fly over, 
you're deflected and you actually fly around it so that you never reach over it or you actually fly into it and don't even know that you've flown into it. There's, there's, all, there's certainly all kinds of theories having to do with it. That one's a stretch. There's another anomaly that I probably should mention in this connection, and that is uh, I grew up in Norway, you know, the 64th degree northerly latitude. If you go a little further north than that, then, uh, you know, up in those latitudes, you can see the aurora borealis very sure. well. Anyway, yes. That's equivalent to about 60 miles north of Anchorage, Alaska. If you go a little further north, it is much easier to see the aurora borealis. And that is, you know, all kinds of beautiful colors flashing across the sky, green, blue, and all these things. But the further north you go, you can see a steady brownish light coming, standing up towards where the North Pole is. Nobody re really have any explanation for that, but it is there. If you get up to around uh, 75 degree northerly latitude, you can see it. So see this, what? This, what are we this seeing? light is... It is a brownish, kind of yellowish brownish light just kind of standing out in the North Pole mm. area. And it's a steady light? It doesn't steady light. It doesn't flash, it doesn't waver. Mm. It is there. I've seen that light. And uh, it is there. And, uh, you know, people always wonder what it is. I know there is an explanation to <coughs> what it is. And I'm not going to say that it is or isn't. But if it is like the stories say that there is a central sun, that could be that light. Mm. I was just going to say that the central sun is coming out from it. Now, is, if this, is this the North Pole that we've shown this picture of? That's correct. Is there a hole in the South Pole? Uh, yes, and much smaller. Oh, so it'd be smaller. I wonder why. I don't know. And I wonder why then. Huh, it's just, I don't know. I mean, all it's of this little... stuff, you've been studying this. You can't take everything. I, I certainly don't. You don't take everything as, you know, if somebody comes up and says, hey, so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so -and -so. You've got a bullshit meter too, don't you? Oh, yeah. What it I mean, goes off quite often. Yeah, it's got to go off. I mean, there's a, this is a story. Um, there's a million. You know, we've been doing there's this too long. There's a million of them. There's Let's a million of them. Mm -hmm. how, how do you detect it? How do you gather your information to come out and write a book and, and, and try to be as truthful well, as you can to your viewers, or, I mean, to your readers or your people you're talking to? Sometimes I, uh, the, my bullshit meter fails, and I only discover the truth after I scrape the eggs off my face. Mm -hmm. well, We've but, been there. Uh, We've been there. Yeah. Scrape some eggs. You yeah. know, you learn as you go, and uh, I've been wrong before, and I will again. I do think that there is more to uh, the hole at the North Pole than what we believe. Mm -hmm. Much of the material that Admiral Byrd came back with was confiscated. And uh, some of it leaked out, and there were some pictures flying around that uh, I think there's much more to it than what we're led to believe. But if, you know, there's, it's, it's a hell of a conspiracy story. I mean, you've got not only the United States government involved in it, you have every known government in the world involved. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have, uh, history would tell you that, that you know, that the pole wasn't always there, you know, on its axis, it's, it shifted before. And so where does that put the hole? I mean, the pole, the hole is then different from where it used to be or where it was. And well, the North therefore Pole Therefore, it travels. wouldn't be center. Yeah, the North Pole travels. <coughs> it travels in a line. If you plot the curvature of where we think the North Pole has gone, it kind of follows a curvature path. And chances are that that might follow the inside of the rim. But aren't we on tectonic plates? And the tectonic plates has been described by scientists as being as if you are the, um, the orange peel of the orange. And you just slip if, if the, ma the magma goes. And the reason the pole shift is because it's the tectonic plates. The inside doesn't move. It's the outside that moves. So, I mean, if there's a hole on the surface, it's going to move and then cover the other hole up on the inside. I, I just don't know how that would work. If you believe in the theory that, mm -hmm. that the um, poles have shifted in the past. But ancient Egypt tells us that they've been, I mean, uh, documents just tell us that, that the poles have, have 
have shifted somewhat. Even even the Perry Reese map and some of the older maps have had to have shifted to be able to have the weather the way it is in certain areas. The woolly mammoths and all of the investigation that was done up there it just shows that mass a massive amount of of energy just kind of thrusted everybody into one corner. That would be hard to to unless a lot of people started digging after it shifted. I, I just. To me, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to let that one Put go. Put that in the wait and see category. We'll probably never know the whole truth on that one. I don't know. I've been thinking. You know, six years ago, I thought I'd know the whole truth on this one, having to do with UFOs. By now, mm -hmm. but uh, it's uh, an ongoing enigma for sure. Boy, it sure is. It just keeps going and going. It's been. When you look at Roswell being kind of like being the beginning of the modern UFO uh -huh. era. That, you know, now it's 51 years ago, and we're, you were still debating this issue, still going on. You wonder if it's ever going to be resolved. You're going to be speaking uh, when? You're here in town in Tucson. It is the uh, third Saturday morning down at the Gaslight Theater here in Tucson. I will be speaking on this subject, and I'm also going to go into a little more, uh, probably a little more socioeconomical aspect of the UFOs too and uh, I'll uh, touch a little more on the uh, astronomical observations from different parts of the world on what's going on on the moon there's uh, some bridges that has been built over craters mm -hmm. that were not there and now they're there and things like that and it's gonna be an interesting little get together and that's at the breakfast club breakfast club they start about eight o'clock <coughs> in the morning eight o'clock in the morning and that is uh, once again what date is this uh, the third Saturday of February, I think it's the 20th. It would be the 20th. Yeah. It would be the 20th of Saturday. So, um, you've got a lot of other material here. You've been doing uh, investigations of uh, contacts or craft crashes. Uh, you have what, some information about a crash. Yeah. In, uh, the Kalahari crash. The Kalahari, the Kalahari, Kalahari yeah, Desert in, uh, crash. This is a document that covers that fairly well. What, uh, to synopsis that, is that um, the South African Air Force and NORAD, they um, saw a craft coming in from space, and it entered the atmosphere over the South Pole, and it went straight north to, towards the South African continent. It entered uh, South African airspace, traveling 5,600 and some 50 miles an hour. That's about 10 times the speed of an airliner. And they tried to contact it. It did not work. So they sent up two jet fighters, which had uh, a Thor II single phase laser cannon on each aircraft. This laser, is wasn't it? Laser cannon, yeah. No, ma mace. Mace. Okay. Maser, yeah. not laser. Mm -hmm. There you go. And uh, this is the epitome of Star Wars technology. And this is so a secret that is not even supposed to exist. And this was 10 years ago. They shot at it. And they blew a 30 centimeter hole right through the craft, and it uh, went down, and it crashed in the desert. And what year was this? It was in 1989. And what did they find? They uh, found bodies in there, and uh, they found some writing in there. They had a linguistic expert in there for uh, several months, and they were able to break the code. And there were uh, some uh, things that they found in the writings, uh, or. Uh, I don't know how they broke it, if it came out of written material or they came out of the onboard computer, I'm not sure. But uh, there were some predictions <coughs> for things that they were supposed to happen, that they were here to help with and make sure it did not happen. And some of that material I haven't gotten my hands on, but uh, some of it I do have. Do and you know uh, what kind of uh, beings were in the craft? They were uh, small, three foot tall beings, and they were dead. There was a number of, uh, I know um, uh, John Mack has talked about uh, other sightings of uh, landed craft mm -hmm. in schoolyards in different parts of Africa. And yeah. this is apparently, there's been a lot of uh, things going on on the African continent yeah. that we're not yeah, this hearing is too much about. This one here is uh, on the South African Air Force Stationery. And uh, I think it does have some credibility to it. It was faxed to us from Europe by someone that is supposed to have been there. So, uh, What's that, on the Kalahari? Yeah. Uh, well, I, uh, I've heard some of it. I've heard, um, 
Well, I do. That's what I do is investigate the crashes. The crashes and there's yeah. a lot more to that story. How yeah. the government came in and take took the stuff. And yeah. The beings that were involved in it and some of the witnesses that were involved in it. There is also a 19... 96, there was also a crash in August in Africa having to do with uh, uh, Africans that <laughs> didn't want anything to do with it, so they ended up calling their local police. They didn't want anything to do with it, which ended up calling their national police, and the national police didn't have a clue of what it was and didn't want anything to do with it. The, uh, it states in the report that the farmer absolutely wanted it off his property. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, really? And it came through uh, uh, Germany, through the United States, and the United States were, ended up going over and retrieving it through a blue fly team. Mm -hmm. um, you would think that if if a flying saucer could come all the way from wherever they're coming from, they wouldn't crash here when they get here. Uh, that's always bothered me unless somehow we're shooting them down or they're flying into something that they're not prepared for but if that was the case they would as many sightings as been reported throughout the world they'd be falling from the sky so I just you know I just don't have a handle on that right now I don't know what's going on whether or not we have land base operations some kind of a weaponry that is shooting these down knowing the trajectory um, and if so, I have reports of over, since 1952, or 47 actually, of about 35 different recovered UFOs throughout the world. What are we doing with the technology? What are we doing with the, the, the beings that uh, inhabit these crafts? And why isn't the public uh, notified about this? That's the interesting thing behind it. I like to... Uh kind of pick your brain a little bit since you've obviously done a lot of research in this field uh, about the nature of those people who are flying those craft. What do you th who do you think they are and what do you think they're doing here? I think I want to put them into three categories. The first category I think would be our own because this government and uh, England and probably other governments around the world, they have this technology and they may have crafts of their own. I know they built, uh, you know, Bob Lazar and, you know, people, they have uh, worked at Area 51 or uh, S4, you know. You know, you hear stories like that. So I think we have our own crafts that is flown. And then I think there are alien crafts from coming from another world here in different types of shaped craft that uh, is spotted from time to time because there are so many different shapes of it. I don't think this government has all these shapes. Triangular, there are, you know, <coughs> cigars and there's uh, all kinds of different shapes and I don't think that uh, the German disc started out being circular and I think they probably stayed with that. And I think also there is an interdimensional because even all the by, way back to uh, Einstein's time, he said that inter he uh, expected to be more than one dimensional existence. I think there are individuals that is traveling in these types of crafts that is coming from a higher level of existence down to our level of existence, or maybe from below up to us in vibratory rate, if you want to call it that way. I think there is some travel across dimensions. Yeah, I, I happen to agree with that. I've, um, I know that uh, Jacques Vallée is sort of a controversial ca person within the UFO phenomenon because I think he b didn't really subscribe to the extraterrestrial hypothesis of, of beings coming from another star system. I think he pretty much felt that all of this phenomenon was interdimensional. I don't know that I would s agree with that, but I do think that there is a lot of interdimensional um, activity and I think a lot of what people are seeing may not necessarily be aliens yeah. from another star system but they may be interdimensional beings mm -hmm. and their their way of, of looking at life is so so different than ours and I think that's we, we get a little bit hung up on we think they should be logical just like us you know land and go visit the president and be on the White House lawn and you know 
follow that scenario, and they're just not, that's not well, how the operator think. Or according to the stories that is out there, you know, they already tried that. <laughs> they got well, I, captured and be. killed or... Yes, that could be anybody dangerous Anybody that deals for with this government when they're coming from another world, they, they have some bad news in store for them. Uh, I want to ask, why do you feel they're coming here? What does your what does your research say? You made a, a a statement saying that one of the stories that you've heard, the reason we haven't gone back to the moon is because somebody was already there, or we were told not to come back. That would indicate that somebody is there. Why are they uh, even bothering with such an insignificant planet way out here in the uh, the hither lands of space? Yeah, that is an awful good question. It needs some thought. But I think that if you look at it, if you look around, Earth may not be that insignificant. The Emerald World is um, it's got a lot of resources. We have water. And uh, I think there are different beings coming here that has different agendas. I think some of the ones that is coming here they are coming here to actually help us. Connecting with a few people here and there, trying to educate them so they can educate us, like Bill and Meyer. I also think that there are others that come here for pure selfish reasons, like maybe the EBs, the greys that uh, come and abduct uh, individuals, implant them with probes that later on they can activate and make them do things, or uh, listen to their thoughts and so on. If we believe that the uh, cattle mutilations was done by these types of races, then that is kind of uh, some of their agenda that uh, they're doing for maybe genetic research on themselves. If they are on the back side of the evolutionary curve themselves, no longer be able to procreate, no longer to be able to sustain, sustain themselves, maybe they need our genes to try to improve their own to the point where maybe they can get back up to they can be able to do these things again. Why wouldn't They're, they ask? Yeah. Well, if they came and asked me, I told them to buzz off. So that's probably the reason. They just Why? If, you, if, if, you, uh, if somebody asks you to, to help save their race, yeah. Where's the yeah. compassion? Are we are we beyond that here in planet Earth? No, no, not you're right on that one. We probably help them out without necessarily hurting ourselves in the process. Mm -hmm. I think. What that, are we afraid of? Yeah, yeah. I, I really think that a lot of people would, uh, you know, say, "Sure, I'll, you know, I'll do what I can." I yeah. think basically we're a compassionate yes, we species, mm -hmm. and we would try to help them out. Mm -hmm. I, I know I've I've have heard all you know those different the different theories. Um, and it, it's so fluid, and it, it seems to change a lot. Um, yeah. The people who, you know, there are people who are having abduction experiences that were first were horrified and frightened and angry, um, coming to a whole, turning 180 degrees, finding that, the, that there was a, a very high purpose to it. Uh, one woman that we had on our show, um, who is a shaman, is she felt that this was all interdimensional and it was just showing us what how we treat everything else on this planet and we were just showing ourselves our own behavior so you just can get so many theories about this mm -hmm. and it's um it's really i think it's very difficult to just nail it down yeah why don't you uh once again how can people get in touch with you here in Tucson, do you have an, uh, some kind of a number and address yeah, if they want to write to you? Yeah, a phone number where someone can call me here for the next uh, couple of three weeks anyway. That is uh, in Tucson, it's 520-807-5256. Have you relocated here? Uh, I'm in the process of doing that now. Okay, you also do, uh, for those that would be interested in taking, uh, moving or going to uh, the Cairo or Egypt yes. or something like that, they can also contact you. you yeah, there, are, there are, uh, you are a travel um, guide or? Yeah, we're a travel company now. We're setting up uh, a trip to Egypt on uh, May 14. May 14. And uh, we have some very good connections over there. We're going to be able to get into some places uh, which normally is not accessible and uh, done that before. So uh, this uh, will be a lot of fun. Okay. 
Um, and once again, if any of you did not get the phone number or the address to any of the information that we have, you can always call Peggy or myself, and we'll be more than happy to give you that. Um, if you had one thing that you could uh, kind of look into this crystal ball and project it within the, the becoming into the new millennium, maybe the year uh, 2001, 2002, what would that be having to do with the extraterrestrial uh, hypothesis that's going on right now? Well, I am totally convinced this government will not release the truth. They have too much at stake. And uh, <coughs> I think, though, that there will be some revelations, but I think there will be from private sources, and the government will still stonewall. But, what? but, but wait a minute, let me okay. qu quickly do this. But why does the government have to do any of it? If there's extraterrestrials here, they're in control. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Well, I mean, why they, aren't they coming out? And I mean, if they're here to help, or they're here to destroy, or they're here to do whatever, why aren't they the ones that are they're activating their choices? Don't they have a freedom of choice themselves? That's what irritates me. Everybody puts it on the government. But it's the, the extraterrestrials. If, in fact, there are extraterrestrials, mm -hmm. then they're the top of the conspiracy chain. Pretty much. Of course, there's only two agendas. One of them is money, and the other one is power. Not when it comes with extraterrestrials. The money, their money, our money wouldn't do anything for them. No, no, but I was talking about our government. And but the since government besides, uh, the government all aside, mm -hmm. the extraterrestrials, Helga Mora was on a show talking about how the extraterrestrials are dealing with individual people in, in different yeah. uh, countries. They're not dealing with, they're not, they don't care about whether it's the gas prices or the oil or the, how much the dollar or whether the euro dollar is going to go. Well, we got about a minute, and I need to get some things in here. Okay. Thanks a lot. I wish we could have done this okay. for longer. So the third week for those of you in Tucson at the Breakfast Club at the Gaslight um, Theater. Theater. Gaslight Theater, yeah. Gaslight Theater. Uh, that will be the 20th. That's Saturday. Um, 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. The next show that we're going to be having will be with a, uh, having to touch on with the skies, having to do with a, a professor from the University of Arizona that has spent uh, uh, probably a good portion of his life studying the stars and then relaying them to the aboriginal tribes, uh, different tribes throughout the world, where I think we're going to focus on Peru and the Mayans and, and why the Mayans and Incas and uh, all looked at the stars, uh, why they studied the stars. So I think that'll be a great show. That'll be the second, second week of February. Second week of February. Then Peggy and I will be gone to to Laughlin, Nevada, and bringing other things back. Then once again into March. For those of you viewing here in town, that we will only have one show in March because we've changed.